Yeah, yeah. So, as I was telling you, there is now a change in the schedule. Professor Suganidi will, will teach now his third lecture in place of Felix Otto. And Felix Otto will teach tomorrow in place of Professor Suganidis. So, thanks uh, also to Takis for giving the, the possibility to, to, to make this change. So, thank you. Thank you for waiting. Can I start? Okay. So, the last thing I did. Where's my friend? He didn't come today. Where's my chalk? Ah! You moved from the seat. I owe you a drink, huh, for that. So, I think I derived the um, formulation with the distance function, so in the case where we had a motion by mean curvature, we said that uh, a triple motion by mean curvature, if and on if the sine distance function dx gamma t satisfies the inequalities. So it is a subsolution to the heat equation. And uh, if in the set where it's negative, and a super solution to the heat equation in the set where it's positive, and in addition, when in this set also satisfies it's a distance function, so the gradient will be 1. And in this set, it's also a distance, uh, I'm sorry. In this set, it's a distance function, so it will have a gradient 1. And here, it's a distance function, and it will have again a gradient 1. But since I'm, we're describing this in the, in the viscosity sense, remember the actual condition is It solves this problem. And in the viscosity sense, this and this are not equivalent. Okay, so the better to write it this equals zero, and uh, I didn't mean that, I meant minus minus plus, yes. Okay, and I, I saw you uh, m waving my hands that uh, that's equivalent to the level set formulation. So that's, uh, that's equivalent to level sets. And then I, I, I said that uh, now we are ready to start uh, the studying the asymptotic behavior of uh, reaction diffusion equations. And I wrote down this. prime of u epsilon equals zero, where w is a double well potential like that with wells of the same depth. Let's say for, to normalize them at minus one, one. And that implies that w prime is uh, something like that. And the two areas It's not like that, it's the other way around. Anyway, it's this or the other. It's not this. All right. And I said that the result, the conjecture, and actual result here is that u epsilon goes to 1 minus 1 uh, inside, outside, and mean curvature flow. So to make it precise at zero, let's say, is um, positive in omega zero and negative in omega zero complement. And to simplify things, uh, let's assume that uh, we have no interior at time t equals zero. 
Okay. So I promise to show you why this happens formally, but right now let's accept it because it fits very well with what I did here and try to prove this in this very particular case using um, uh, this result here. There is a nice uh, cute proof, but it's like magic. So I'm going to make the assumption, I have to make another assumption. Uh, U0 is well prepared. I know that this is a very illuminating assumption, which means, all right. What's so special about such a reaction diffusion equation? The special thing is that meets traveling wave solutions. Okay? So when you have a, a bistable nonlinearity, because that's, the, as I said, it's either this or the other, when you have an inequality like that, um, there is a traveling wave, there is a standing solution, for, uh, there is a solution to this problem of the form <coughs> minus uh, C minus Q double prime plus W1 prime Q equals zero for Q being plus minus one. So any time you have a, a nonlinearity that comes from a potential like that, uh, there's a theorem that says there is a, a solution of that form. So this is a one dimensional solution of the type And that solution it exists. The speed C is unique. And the solution is unique up to translation by constants. And the only condition is that it decays exponentially to the equilibria at plus minus infinity. So that's a fact. For any W like this, there is a solution like that. So I rewrite it. And um, the unique, it's increasing. Uh, it's unique up to translations. So let's make it unique if we assume that Q of zero is zero and C is unique. That's a fact of life. And as a matter of fact, you can even have an expression for C uh, because if you multiply the equation by Q prime and integrate, so if I multiply by Q prime and uh, integrate from uh, minus infinity to infinity, from here I get minus C, Q prime square, that goes away. And here I get uh, plus uh, I get plus w at one minus w at minus one equals zero. So the speed is exactly uh, like that. Okay, and uh, and somehow it's unique, although it's multiplied by this factor, but it's it's unique. All right. So you see from here that if I'm in a special situation where um, the two pot uh, wells are at the same depth, these are the same. So if W plus at minus W at minus one is the same as W plus one, then the C is zero. And it is in this case we are working here because I'm making that assumption. And as I will indicate later on, this is why I can put an epsilon square there. Okay, so we do that. So my, my normalization here is that this will be like that, where this is a traveling wave. Okay, so with this assumption, let's see what we do. Um, 
this uh, assumption suggests that perhaps we should make a change of variables like that. Now, um, you may think this is crazy, but once I show you the formal proof, you're going to see that that's exactly what the formal proof does. But let's start with this, and now let's compute what does the epsilon do. So the epsilon solves this equation. Okay, I'm going a little bit fast here. Just do the computation. Uh, up to here, without dividing by u prime, you get what comes from the Laplacian and the time derivative. Then I use that f of q. I use the fact that uh, q double prime is equal w, w prime q. I use this fact. q double prime, that was uh, that q. Remember, when c is 0, the w solves that. So that's the q I'm using. And if you do here the calculation, OK, let me do it slower. So I compute the equation for z epsilon. So I write down derivatives and I get 1 over epsilon q prime z epsilon t minus 1 over epsilon q prime Laplacian z epsilon minus 1 over epsilon q double prime epsilon square dz epsilon square plus 1 over epsilon w prime q. And that should be 0. On the other hand, by the choice of q, this term here is q double prime. That's, the defi that's what q does. So, uh, so that eliminates w prime, brings in the q double prime. So I'm down to 1 over epsilon q dot z epsilon t minus 1 over epsilon q dot Laplacian z epsilon minus 1 over epsilon square. So this is q double prime. I bring it in. And I get that. OK? I simplify by the 1 over epsilon, divide by q prime. Remember, the traveling wave is increasing. So I can do that. And I'm left with the equation z epsilon t minus Laplacian z epsilon minus q double prime over q prime, evaluated at z epsilon over epsilon dz epsilon square minus 1. Okay, and I claim that this problem is uh, much easier to understand than what it was the original before. So uh, for the students, this is a situation, and it happens often in, in, um, in PDE, where if you start with a linear problem, in, um, or semi-linear in this case, forget the form of w prime, and um, uh, you want to get some estimates, and, and it turns out that occasionally it's better to make the problem nonlinear. Because once you make the problem nonlinear, you break the symmetry of the linearity, so um, you may be able to, to, to get something more useful. And another context when this thing comes up all the time, uh, in a very simple form, but the problem is more general than that. For example, if someone gives you the Laplacian, if you assume that u is positive, often what you do is you make this change. This call is known as the Hopf call transformation. And that leads to that nonlinear PD. But because of the presence of this nonlinearity, you can do more things, not, of course, in terms of uh, but if you want to get estimates and so on, it's more convenient to do it this way. And in some sense, this is the transformation that we are doing here. The only difference is the q double prime being a function that is like that. You have different behavior for this factor at either end. OK, so 
This is perhaps one of the few proofs I'll give in full detail, so bear with me. So clearly, I want to send epsilon to 0. And if I send, uh, there is an epsilon here. Because this was the only term with a 1 over epsilon square. So I want to let epsilon go to 0. And the only thing I'm going to get if I let epsilon go to 0 um, is that d, if the z epsilon had a limit, I will get that dz squared equals 1. Right? Multiply by epsilon. Let epsilon to 0. This factor, this uh, coefficient goes to to different limits. So let's say this goes to which are non-zero. You can compute it easily from here. OK. So if I let epsilon go to 0, the best you hope to get is dz squared equals 1. If the, uh, let's assume that the z epsilons have a limit. Assume. For now, that the z epsilons have some limit. And what do you expect at the limit to have? You would expect that dz squared to be 1. That looks good, because it looks like a distance. And if, if you could show that that goes to 0 really fast, you will get zt minus Laplacian z equals 0. And somehow, if you were on the front, you had a front movie by mean curvature. Of course, this is a dream, and we're not going to get it. But let's see what we can get. So what I'm going to get for the limit is the limit satisfies that. So I will prove for you, assuming there is a limit, I don't want to get into these technicalities, that the limit is a subsolution to the heat equation, and it is a distance with a negative sign when it's negative, satisfies that when it's positive, and therefore it's motion by mean curvature. So let's see how we do that. I don't want equality at the limit. I want inequality. So somehow, the only hope I have to get, to get this inequality, because I know equality will not hold, is if I can create a sign here. If this thing can, uh, we can find a sign for that quantity, sign S-I-G-N. OK, so the first claim I'm making is that since d0, d0 is less or equal 1, gradient of z is less or equal 1. Now, if you say, oh, I know how to do it. Uh, it's a parabolic PD. Uh, there is a, a code for the kinds of things you can do for the exist equations to get Lipschitz bound, and it's called the Bernstein argument. Bernstein type argument, which suggests, which basically says, write down this quantity you want to compute, to estimate, subtract something that depends on you, write the equation satisfied by that, and apply the maximum principle after you, you make a lot of uh, changes here or there. If you try to do this, you are doomed. And the reason is that once you hit this with derivatives, you bring in more epsilons, and you bring in cubic, in some sense, you create a cubic term in the gradient. And that is a problem. But there's a shortcut to that. And this is, uh, I, I always do that when I teach uh, course in viscous solutions. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's a beautiful shortcut, which says the following. Let's define the function, and w is not good anymore. OK, psi of xt to be uh, uh, the soup of uh, z epsilon xt minus x minus y. No, I'm saying something stupid. Sorry for that. Look at z epsilon xt minus z epsilon yt minus x minus y. Look at that expression. You double the variables. We want to claim 
that um, we want to prove out of that this estimate. It holds initially, so the only thing I care is that look at the maximum of that for t positive, because if the maximum happens at t0, then uh, I have the answer. So you look at that, and then uh, 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 what happens at this maximum? Uh, and then, of course, you have to assume there is a maximum. So, so look at the maximum of that. Um, so two things will happen. So let's call the maximum x bar, y bar. Either x bar is equal to y bar at the maximum, which means that uh, that will imply that z epsilon xt is less equal z epsilon yt. So that's one direction of that bound. OK, that's one direction of this bound. Or or x bar is not equal to y bar. OK, there are two alternatives. But if x bar is not equal to y bar, remember the z epsilon are smooth functions. Gradient z epsilon will be equal to x bar over y bar over x bar minus y bar. Because that's uh, when x bar at the maximum minus y, at the maximum, that's a differentiable function if, it's, if you're not at zero. And since the z epsilon is a smooth function, the gradient will be like that. Which, of course, is one. And if you use the definition of the maximum, that implies the answer. Because that implies that z epsilon xt is less equal z epsilon uh, yt plus x minus y, if you have that. So that's the idea of the proof. OK, so you get the Lipschitz bound for free, but it was important to have it initially. That's why I said I have to prepare well my initial data. OK, once I have this bound, once I observe that I have this bound, now I'm home free. Why? Because let's see what happens. I let now epsilon to 0. And I look at the set first z negative. z, remember, is the limit of the z epsilons. So look at the set where it's negative. If the limit is negative, that means the z epsilon for small epsilon is negative somewhere, which means that this thing is negative. Right? So when the limit is negative, for small epsilon, this quantity is negative. Because this quantity is positive. I'm, I'm sorry, what the heck is this quantity? Yeah, it's positive at uh, minus infinity. And it's multiplied by minus. So negative, negative, positive. Again, we know it's negative. This is negative, it's positive for small epsilon. That means that actually I have this inequality. Because if this is positive, this has to be negative. And therefore, letting epsilon to 0, I get this inequality. In the set where z is positive, I still have this negative, but now this is positive. And so I get z epsilon t minus Laplacian z epsilon greater or equal 0. And after I let epsilon go to 0, z t minus Laplacian z greater or equal 0. 
have half of what I want, but I did not use the big thing I had from the beginning, that that goes to zero. So if you let epsilon also go to zero, you get this goes to a positive. So now we look what happens here. You multiply by epsilon, let epsilon go to zero. This goes to a negative constant back there. So you get at the limit minus dz squared minus 1 less equal 0. And because dz squared is less equal 1, you get equality, but with a minus, which together with the fact that dz is less equal 1 will give us minus dz squared plus 1 equals 0. And we get dz squared minus 1 greater or equal 0. And now, to which together with the dz less equal 1 gives us the dz squared minus 1 equals 0. This is in the z negative. This is in the z positive. And now I'm done. Because you go back to the original chains, and what we prove is that whenever the limit is positive, this goes to 1. And whenever the limit is negative, it goes to minus 1. But when, when it's positive, is uh, inside the set that moves by mean curvature, and it's negative outside the set that moves by mean curvature. And that's, uh, in some sense, the slickest proof you can have for that. But uh, in general, when you have a very slick proof, you don't hope this to work for, for everything. In particular, this proof will not work if I make the following simple change. So I allow an x-dependence on the potential, or I put something anisotropic in front, And the reason is that, uh, OK, for this particular proof, it's going to fail uh, very quickly with, uh, uh, with uh, um, when you write down the equation where it's going to fail. It's going to fail because x by x, the traveling wave now will depend on x. OK, the assumption is that for every x, this is a cubic nonlinearity. I mean, it's a by step, whatever. It's a double well potential with wells of the same depth. So the Q would depend on X. This is a parameter. So when I write the when I make the change of variables Q X Z over epsilon, I can do that. Nothing prevents me from making that change of variables. But now, once I start getting derivatives, I'm going to start producing derivatives in Q uh, with x, which will create additional terms here. And if I create additional terms here, so my trick is not going to work anymore. OK? Are there any questions about this, this proof? Um, I, I know it looks like magic, and it's, uh, it's short. But uh, as I said, it, it, it's the. Um, That's life. OK, some history about this problem uh, with proofs. This proof, first proof of something like that was given by Kohn and Bronsert in the, in the radial symmetric case. Then there were a result, was a very nice result by the Motoni and Satzman uh, up to the first time you had singularities. And I mentioned Di Mottoni also because Di Mottoni had a house a, a, a little bit out of here. And the last time I was in Trieste, uh, he invited us and, uh, and had a beautiful view and so on. And he passed, died in an accident, I think, so uh, years ago. So Di Mottoni and Satzman, and then Chen, uh, there, who is at pitch proof, there are a lot of initials there, uh, also provide the same proof uh, again, up to the first time there was singularity. 
The first proof past singularities uh, was given by um, Evans and um, Sonner and myself some time ago, and then uh, more work uh, happened, took place, and um, uh, okay. So uh, now let me go back. I show you this proof. It looks like magic. Let me describe to you. If you were an applied mathematician. Uh, which in my department will be a sin, but uh, um, if you were an applied mathematician, how would you figure out that motion by mean curvature plays a role in this problem? So we forget this now nice rigorous proof, and we go to the argument of um, Now, this classification of mathematics into pure and applied is really awful because it suggests that people who do applied math are not clean or pure or whatever. It's a, it's a, so together with a friend of mine, we decided that the better definition is classical versus modern mathematics. You pick which one you prefer to be that, and if you wanted to go even further, you could say static versus dynamic mathematics. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, um, so here's a formal. Which, in the end, turns out, uh, uh, after a lot of uh, a big cycle of work, to, to be able to justify it rigorously. And as a matter of fact, there was a whole cycle which I will try to describe to you. So the first proofs were very elegant and so on. And then uh, at the end, with Bar, we figured out a way to say that we don't need all these elegant proofs, that we can do the problem in a different way faster. OK. And I will try to explain it. So formal derivation, we start with this problem. Uh, we expect that, uh, so W is, um, let's say, a potential double wells. Just if, to simplify things, one minus one, a general potential like that. And you expect to have, um, uh, you want to see what happens as epsilon goes to zero. So this is the same as saying I start with this reaction diffusion equation and study what happens if the solution as T goes to infinity. Of course, this problem had been there even before Allen and Kahn. Allen and Kahn made the, con made the connection with mean curvature, but people like uh, researchers like Aronson and Weinberger had looked at the behavior as t goes to infinity of this problem. And what you expect to see as t goes to infinity is the solution becoming either plus one or minus one. And then of interest is to see wh uh, what happens to the interface in between the plus one and the minus one, which for, posi for, fine, for uh, t large, whatever, is a soft, is a smooth transition. So if you want to figure out, if we want to figure out the long time behavior, it is often very convenient to introduce a scaling like that, because the behavior of u as t goes to infinity is similar to the behavior of u epsilon 1 as epsilon goes to 0. And if you do that, you have to figure out what to do with space. In principle, if you do that, x may go far away. So what you're trying to do is you try to keep things in a compact set, so you introduce the scaling. OK, so what this does is it, it tells you um, what happens for long time and, uh, and uh, long time, long space, large space. OK, so this is long time, large space. 
behavior. And uh, basically what you expect is this to go to one and minus one. Okay, long time will go to the equilibria, and for large space, the right and left, you go there. Okay, so it makes sense, therefore, to start with this problem. And so what uh, Keller, Rubinstein, and Sternberg, for the students, I highly recommend this paper. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful applied math paper with nothing rigorous, but uh, uh, that's how you learn to do formal asymptotics if you don't know how to do it. And it takes a little bit of getting used to it. So, so I don't mess up the notation. Um, what they make, they make the conjecture that uh, they can write a solution which will depend on epsilon. They can have an asymptotic expansion for the solution. And the asymptotic expansion will have a first term that we'll call it u0, x, tau. Uh, bear with me, I'll put all the variables in it. And then there will be a next term in the expansion. And of course, other terms, if, you, if you're brave. So let me tell you what the things are. Uh, the z here will be like uh, some phi of x t over epsilon. So this z there will be like the capital Z epsilon I had before. Uh, tau will be the time t over epsilon. And eta will be the time epsilon t. So we're looking at something for long scale. We are putting in a scaling. And this, this type of uh, expansion allows for the possibility that we either overscale the problem, that actually what happens happens at slower t, and that's the eta t there, or it happens for, large, uh, for longer t, which is the uh, t over epsilon. So writing it like that, you capture uh, both possible be uh, both behaviors, and the assumption is that, uh, and this phi in principle will depend on eta too, and, um, uh, and you make this ansatz, right? The ansatz is that uh, uh, the solution should look like uh, that. And now we try to figure out what phi does. So to do that, we write down equations. Namely, you do the calculation I did before with the z epsilon, but now you do it for all this mess. So if you do that, you are going to get terms that have 1 over epsilon in front, terms that are going to have nothing in front, and terms that are going to have epsilon in front, and so on. We care only about the terms that have 1 over epsilon in front and, epsilon, and nothing. So you get the following two equations. u0 tau plus phi t u0z minus d phi square u0zz plus w prime u0 equals 0. This is the term you're going to get from the, the, uh, the expansion for everything that has 1 over epsilon in front. Notice if I take a time derivative here, I get a 1 over epsilon derivative with respect to tau. Uh, I have the epsilon there. And when I, I do this term, I will get this. The same way I got the q double prime there. So this is the thing that multiplies the 1 over epsilon. And the thing that multiplies epsilon to the 0 is u1, u1 tau plus phi t u1z OK, where does this thing pop out? Uh, I do a formal expansion, so if I plug that in, I have w prime of u0 plus epsilon u1. And I will write this thing as w1 u0 plus epsilon w prime u0 u1 plus higher order terms. There is a 1 over epsilon in front, so when I find the terms that do not depend on epsilon, I will get, I will get rid of that epsilon. If you ask me why don't I go higher, I know I don't need to go in more derivatives. 
and, um, and everything we are assuming, we, we, we can do these things and so on. So we got these two equations. No, I, I, I didn't finish that, sorry. This is going to be equal minus u0 t plus Laplacian phi u0 z plus 2 grad phi dot du0 z minus phi eta u0 z. Okay, that's as general as it can go. And uh, here I didn't say I, at t equals 0, t is phi 0 x over epsilon. So that was the initi our initialization does not depend on eta, t, and tau, of course. Say it again. How do I get uh, a second derivative? Yes, no, no, the, in the, the last term, w prime is zero to one. Ah, uh, this is dw. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's the derivative. Uh, uh, All right, so we do a formal analysis. So basically what we need to do is we need to find u0 and u1. And, um, and, and we need to find phi. And what is going to happen is phi will come up as a, the, what phi does is going to turn out to be a compatibility condition in order to be able to solve u0 and u1. Okay. So when you do something like that, a formal expansion, you're assuming that at some point you can take the variables to be independent of each other. I know that's uh, weird, but that's in some, in this is the, the applied aspect of what I'm doing is, uh, although everything here is mixed with each other, I'm going to look at these things and I say, okay, once I have one variable, the other variables are constant. It's a completely formal argument. And uh, then you have an equation here. This is a straight equation for u0. There is nothing else there. So you bet either you are able to solve it or not. And then you have an equation for u1, which looks more or less the same up to here. And there is a right-hand side. OK? And any time we learn in PDE to solve a problem with the right-hand side, we know that we can do it provided the right-hand side is orthogonal to the kernel of the adjoint. So we know, therefore, that in order to be, in order to be able to find u prime, this thing has to be perpendicular to the kernel of the adjoint problem. And that condition, that compatibility condition, will give us the equation for phi. Okay, so you should always think of that because that's what's happening in these problems. Uh, it, it, um, the equation satisfied by phi is a condition you need in order to be able to close this expansion. Right? That more or less says that I don't have to worry about going higher up. I can close the expansion. I'm done. Okay, now let's uh, figure out how we do that. And so now we make more assumptions. We're going to make the assumption that, uh, I mean, somehow you know what you want to prove. Huh? So we're going to assume that u0 of z x tau t eta looks like a traveling wave. For t, for tau large. So tau, which is uh, this variable t over epsilon, uh, and of course we can think of tau large because uh, it's fixed t, but it's like epsilon going to zero. So you make these answers. Now with these answers, we try to simplify the equations. Now if you ask me how do you make these answers, uh, when you start something like that, you have a little bit of an idea of what you're trying to get. Huh? I mean, you don't... And 
what do you know for these problems? You know what I said, the old results of Aronson, Weinberger, and others, where you knew that there were traveling waves and the solutions had attracted, uh, uh, the traveling waves attract the solutions and all this. Okay, so you make these answers, and once you do that, you can simplify the problem. So the first equation, with the, if the u0 is like that, the first equation becomes So now I replace the z derivative by derivatives. Uh, the, the anything with z derivative becomes q, pri q double prime. Q uh, depends, de becomes a prime. So uh, this is like that. So now you see, I start coming back to the thing I had, like the traveling wave. So the Q has to satisfy like that. Also, the assumptions here will be that uh, uh, as uh, Z goes to plus minus infinity, this should go to one or minus one, the two equilibria, okay, or the W. So I have this. That's what the U zero has to be like the Q, which is like that. Now I do the same thing. I multiply by Q prime, integrate the, the Xi, let's say, and I get that, um, as before, that phi T minus C uh, should be equal to um, minus W plus 1 minus W minus 1 uh, divided Uh, this is the computation I did before. So I multiply by Q prime, integrate, and, and so on, so I get this. And now if you want to simplify things a little bit more, if you make a change of variables, because remember, the Q, what is the Q? What is the argument of the Q? The argument of the Q is phi uh, uh, over uh, phi minus CT over epsilon. That's really the argument of, of Q. Okay, and uh, so if you want to uh, eliminate that, eliminate the epsilon from there. So in principle, the way it's written, the Q depends on epsilon. Of course it's not, but there is an epsilon inside the Q. All right, so to eliminate that, you make an additional change of variables. You write a Z, you introduce a variable S, which is now Z minus uh, um, C tau over D phi. That's just uh, dressing now in this problem. Uh, in that case, you find that this problem becomes uh, let's forget that. So you just make this change, and if you plug it in and do the calculation, you find that phi t uh, minus uh, over c over d phi is minus W plus minus W minus 1. And if I rewrite this as like, like that, yeah, let's keep it the way I had it. And so you see that uh, if there is a non-trivial right-hand side, uh, the phi solves this equation. And the non-trivial right-hand side has to do with whether uh, this uh, um, is um, zero or not. If this is zero, best up something here, I think you get this. Now, if this is zero, which is the case of the double well potential of the same depth, then basically you get that phi is independent of t. And the next dependence on phi 
is now on eta. Okay, so that implies that phi is really a function of x and eta. Okay? So to figure out what happens now, we have to go into the next term. So we go into the next term. Funny how the the formal thing takes so much work, but I, I decided to show you all the details. So if um, uh, uh, this thing gives us zero information, because if C is zero, basically there is no C here. This is gone, so this is phi t minus C. This is gone, and what you find is the traveling wave I had before, the, by, the, by state, the, the one. So now you make the same assumption on U1, bear with me. The same assumption I made for u0, now I'm making it for u1. And if I do that, to simplify, let me write directly what we get here. We get minus d phi square p double prime plus w double prime q p is equal to Laplacian phi plus 2 grad phi grad Okay, that's what we get on the right hand side. Okay, so now how does the Fredman's alternative come in? The Fermat's alternative is going to come down for this operator. So the, the, the operator on which you are going to apply Fermat's alternative is this one. You have this problem. Let's linearize it. It's easy to see by taking a derivative that Q prime solves this problem, right? And uh, Q prime goes here. And the form of the W implies that the kernel of this linearized operator, of this operator, the linearized operator is minus d phi square p double prime plus w prime of q prime. The assumptions of w imply that uh, there is only one dimension in the kernel. So in particular, any solution, and because the q prime does it, the kernel of that operator, the kernel, the adjoint of L star, is basically um, Q prime, spanned by Q prime. Okay? Which means which implies that to have P, this mess here, integrating from minus infinity to infinity, uh, Laplacian phi I'm messing up something here. 
Yeah, sorry for that. That is the correct right hand side. Uh, it means that Laplacian phi minus phi eta two dot square plus two q prime integral from minus infinity to infinity a grad phi grad q prime square d xi should be zero. Okay, that's the orthogonality condition I mentioned. That's Fresnel's alternative. Okay. The Q prime comes up as a factor here. Remember, the big assumption, since everything is formal, is that the variables, we can freeze any variable we want. And uh, so we get that. Now, this looks a little bit more weird, but this, because of the 2, this becomes minus q, or becomes d phi dot gradient with respect to x of q prime square xi. Now, you say, oh, there's gradient, we're integrating in prime part. Remember, the integration is in xi, it's not in x. And so, why does this thing have anything to do with mean curvature? The reason that this has, uh, why this thing has to do with mean curvature is the following. Remember our R here? Remember this change of variables we made? That change of variables had the effect to tell us that the only x dependence on q was through that. So q is really Q of uh, uh, xi and, uh, and uh, x is really r xi over d phi. That's what it is. So now I can compute the derivative of this because I know exactly what is the x dependence. And if I do it carefully using that in mind, I'm going to get that uh, I, uh, q double prime square phi prime phi eta minus delta phi, uh, Laplacian phi minus grad phi grad of grad phi over grad phi d xi equals zero. So the only thing I'm doing uh, is I'm using this form of q. So when I compute q xi, I bring in a gradient, a derivative of 1 over d phi. When I compute a derivative of 1 over d phi, I'm going to create this term. I mean, this is d phi here. That's where this thing comes from. But this is nothing else but the mean curvature. So this is a constant. This has to be 0. So that is 0. And that's exactly, if you compute these terms, this is exactly the motion by mean curvature uh, equation. So that's the connection in a very uh, semi-rigorous, semi-concrete um, um, way. So uh, just five minutes. I need to, to, to bridge with the next lecture. Um, this approach that I present, okay, I put everything there. This approach, so what I'm going to do next time, the next time I'm going to show you how to look at problems just to show you what else you need to do if there is additional dependence. And the answer will be again, now that we know how things work, it will be that the u epsilon will look like some q, let's make it simple, distance over epsilon x plus epsilon p 
distance over epsilon x. The meaning of these things is the same. And we're going to have to choose the p so that we can control the errors we make when we bring in x derivatives of q. So it's the same argument. There are, however, a bunch of problems of real interest where you also scale the x environment. Um, how do you get this equation? Let's go back for a minute. Uh, I started with the idea that we obtain these problems by, by scaling a reaction diffusion equation. So how do you get that? You get this by scaling, of course, this problem. But to get an x there, you have to put an x there. Okay? To get that, you need to start with this problem, which basically says that you are not far away from being homogeneous. Because as epsilon goes to 0, uh, you don't have it there. What happens, however, if at, the, at that level, I want to scale this problem? Now, if I scale this problem, this is going to bring me to that regime. Now it's going to create a homogenization problem combined with uh, front propagation. But now I have to worry about two things. I have to worry, and let's assume that W is periodic in X. So there are two mechanisms that are going to take place here. One is, again, this front propagation, an expansion in a direction orthogonal to the front. And the other is the averaging that's going on from the x over epsilon. So these two mechanisms give, will act together and um, uh, combine to give you the answer. However, the method I presented is going to collapse here because I cannot put any more the chains Q over distance epsilon plus, OK, there will be an x over epsilon here, blah, blah. But there is an interaction with these two scales now. So you cannot do it with an actual traveling wave. So to solve this problem, you have to use what is known as pulsating waves. which. I will explain next time. But these pulsating waves will lead to expansions of the form and now there will be an additional gradient dependence because these pulsating waves are anisotropic so they depend on the direction you go. And so if you try to make an expansion that will bring in a gradient of d, which is the direction of the normal. Now, forget any kind of rigorous argument. If I try to write down an equation for this, I get in trouble. Because I will have to compute the Laplacian of the gradient. That will bring me a third derivative. And that's a sin in viscosity theory. Because there's nothing you can do with a third derivative. If the distance is smooth, of course, that's not a problem, because that third derivative is multiplied by an epsilon. So if I were in the smooth regime, it's not a problem. And but on the other hand, the whole argument, the whole theory is to go beyond the smooth regime. And to do that, there is an issue. And so because of that, I will introduce next time yet another way to describe the front. Where now, instead of writing uh, a PDE, I'm going to think about an evolution of sets. And there, instead of using smooth test functions to define viscosity solutions, I'm going to use smooth surfaces evolving by the right velocity as test surfaces. And once I do that, everything will be reduced to dealing with smooth things. And therefore, I will not have a problem. 
Okay, so I'll do that uh, whenever, tomorrow. Thank you, and sorry for being late. Huh? You can blame the people who keep the door. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.